to everyone in the eastern, central, and mountain states. Good afternoon to those of you on the west coast and in Hawaii. And good morning, albeit tomorrow morning, to those of you joining us from greater China. I'm Jan Barris, Vice President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone from 39 venues in the United States and Asia to our third annual Chinatown Hall, National Reflections, Local Connections. Our president, Steve Orleans, had planned to moderate this webcast, but illness has prevented that. He sends his deep regrets and best wishes for what he and I know is going to be a great program tonight. China and U.S.-China relations have suddenly appeared on everyone's radar screens. Decades ago, when I started studying Chinese, people would ask me why in the world I was doing so. No one asked me that anymore. China regularly appears on the front pages of newspapers, the covers of magazines, and among the lead stories on the evening broadcasts. Americans want to know more about China and better understand it, and our relations with it. And we could have no one better to talk to us about these issues than Dr. Kurt Campbell, our Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Kurt, an old friend of the committees, is intimately involved in American-China policy and has recently returned from traveling to China with President Obama. I might add the interesting fact, and I think a telling one, Kurt, that uh, Obama was the first American president to choose to go to China during his first term. And you might want to expand on that a little bit during the Q&A part. But before turning to Kurt, I want to thank all of our partners in the various venues for helping put this program together. Our small but very dedicated National Committee staff has done a terrific job in coordinating this nationwide event. But we couldn't have done it without our venue partners' help. Let me also thank our wonderful speakers at the various venues. They have volunteered their time to travel throughout the United States to talk with you because they believe, as do we, that educating Americans about China will help fashion policies that are in the long-term interest and best interests of the United States. We thank the Star Foundation for so generously providing the funding for this immense undertaking. Finally, let me thank Kurt Campbell. Uh, you all have his bio, so I won't take time to list his accomplishments, which are many and impressive. But I will say from having traveled to Asia with Kurt on several occasions, participating in many meetings and track to dialogues with him, that you're in for a real treat. After Kurt's remarks, I will be asking him questions that you email to us from around the country. We encourage you to submit your questions even during his talk so that we will have some in the queue as soon as he's done. We'll try to get to all of them, but I want to apologize in advance to those whose questions we don't have a chance to answer. And now, Kurt, let me turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. It's really an honor to be with you today. And let me just say that few people uh, over the course of the last 20 years have done more to contribute to a stronger relationship between the United States and China than Jan. My mother and, will thank you for that. And I've, I've been the benefit, a beneficiary of uh, many of these dialogues and meetings, and her dedication is known throughout uh, the entire circle of people that think about U.S.-China relations. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, let me just begin with some overarching themes, and frankly, I'm looking very much forward to answering questions and hopefully, hopefully interacting with the audience in terms of things that are uh, of concern to Americans outside of Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let me begin by suggesting an important dimension of this administration. If you look back over the course of the last 100 years, I think it'd be fair to say that most of the presidents who were elected, to the extent that they had any international experience, and most of our presidents have been primarily domestically oriented in terms of their experience, uh, and their uh, uh, focus. To the extent that there was uh, international engagement, it was primarily uh, uh, in Europe and in Latin America. And you see that with, with Woodrow Wilson and Presidents Roosevelt, uh, with John Kennedy and others. In many respects, uh, President Obama, uh, among many of his uh, characteristics that are unique, 
One is, of course, in many respects, he is um, the first Asian Pacific president in the sense that he uh, was raised in Hawaii and spent an enormous amount of time uh, uh, at a young age traveling through Indonesia, parts of Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. I've had a chance to spend quite a bit of time with him, and he has a feel uh, for Asia and a knowledge that, frankly, I found a little intimidating in my initial interactions with him. His knowledge about intricacies of village life in the Philippines or uh, certain uh, declensions in uh, 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 the Indonesian national language I was uh, shocked by. But in fact, it's very much to our great advantage in terms of those of the pe people who are interested in the promotion of uh, strong U.S. relations uh, with Asia as a whole. The president came in with his senior advisors believing that there was a perception in Asia uh, and also in China that the United States had been a little bit preoccupied away from the drama that was playing out in the Asia Pacific region and that we were more focused on important, though um, uh, not uh, Asia-focused issues like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. And the president was determined that his Secretary of State, his key players um, uh, in the cabinet would focus an enormous amount of time during uh, its first year in office on uh, these issues in the Asia-Pacific region and not limit ourselves simply to economic issues but a broad range of questions that confront the United States today. Our first goal has been to send a message that the United States is fully engaged and that we are a resident power and player in the politics of the Asia-Pacific region. We saw uh, uh, over the course of the last several months Secretary Clinton uh, visit Asia three times and she convened the first ever uh, China strategic dialogue between the United States and uh, senior uh, leaders in the foreign ministry. President Obama chose during the first several months of his administration to make a major visit to Asia at a time where there were pressing uh, decisions to be made on Afghanistan and on health care to send a message of how important uh, these questions and issues are. Uh, the centerpiece in many respects of this trip was our re-engagement with our allies, Japan and South Korea, our commitment to economic issues, uh, the free trade agreement with South Korea, uh, a new negotiation on uh, a free trade agreement of a larger group of nations in Southeast Asia, um, a, a, a new commitment to a broader dialogue in Southeast Asia, but also, and perhaps most importantly, a visit uh, to China, where the president spent um, uh, three days, both a visit to Shanghai and Beijing. I think it is now uh, commonplace and well understood that one of the most consequential bilateral relations that the United States will engage in in the 21st century is the one between the United States and China, and that is now undeniable. It is uh, the case that almost every major issue confronting the United States, whether it be climate change, proliferation, uh, poverty, energy insecurity, all of these issues cannot be addressed adequately without a stronger base of cooperation between the United States and China. Um, the preparation for the president's uh, trip was enormous behind the scenes. And what we found was a deep and broad dialogue, but a dialogue that reflects the changing nature of U.S.-China relations. The truth is that the United States has had few relationships historically that will prepare us adequately for the complexities of the U.S.-China relations. We've had a relationship, obviously, with great, a country like Great Britain, uh, close, harmonious, generally uh, see most issues eye to eye. And for 50 years, we had a relationship with a country like the Soviet Union, uh, highly conflictual, enormous tension, deep uncertainty. The relationship with China is going to be um, very different. It's going to embody uh, areas of uh, deep and uh, in, indeed profound cooperation, but it will also have areas of misunderstanding, of competition, uh, and uncertainty. And it's the combination of these issues that is going to pose the greatest challenge, not just to American leaders, but the understanding of the American people. Every major consequential issue, like economic issues, trade issues, questions of human rights, democratization, countries seeking to uh, develop nuclear weapons in North Korea and in Iran, all of these issues are now central to the conduct of U.S.-China relations. And the president's visit to China reflected 
this fullness and the uh, drama, in a sense, that is currently playing out between Beijing and Washington. In our um, deliberations between the two sides, there was a, a, a broad uh, discussion about the need to rebalance our relationship on an economic basis, that the United States would need to save more going forward. And indeed, China, for us to have a more sustainable economic relationship, would need to develop a middle class more, uh, would need to think of the United States not as uh, the only export market, but need to re structure its economy to deal with the complexities of the global financial situation. We dealt with regional issues like Iran and North Korea. Um, we uh, talked about uh, the challenges of poverty. You will see from our joint statement uh, a deep and full set of issues that we're working together reflecting a deepening and broadening relationship. I think it's also the case that we uh, met at a time uh, on the uh, outskirts, if you will, of one of the most consequential negotiations in history on uh, the climate uh, change uh, uh, negotiations that are underway now in Copenhagen. And the president and uh, uh, his uh, Chinese counterparts debated and d discussed these issues at a level and an intensity um, that uh, heretofore has been missing in the overall debate. I think it would be fair to say that we were surprised that some of the criticism that we had domestically on this trip. And I think, you know, one of the things that happens when you're in government, you try not to be defensive to this. You try to listen to the criticism. But I must say that I think some of it was, was misplaced. The idea that an American president can come to China in the current circumstances and demand, demand fundamental changes and deliverables, I think that doesn't accurately reflect the nature of a much more complicated relationship that is evolving, that's going to take a much higher degree of education on the part of the United States, a deeper patience and commitment, and a recognition that we have no choice but to get this relationship right. Too much is riding on it. Jan. OK. Um, well, you touched actually on a question that I was going to ask you, although I promised to save as much time as possible for our questioners who are coming in from the outside. But I must say that most of the China scholars that I know, in reading that joint statement, which was six pages long, very small print, and as you said, shows the depth and the breadth of the relationship. And it's extraordinarily expanded over the years. So given what I would see as a deliverable in terms of that statement, why is it you think that you got such negativity from the American press? Well, it's, a, it's an important question. It's one I think I, I think it'd be fair to say that we've reflected on extensively. I, I think there are a variety of reasons. First of all, it got very positive treatment throughout Asia. And I think I and others uh, in the administration have heard similar comments from uh, friends from the expert community and elsewhere about how important the visit was and how the president struck the right tone uh, uh, overall. Um, first of all, I think that the trip happened at a period of the, shall we say, the arc of the president's uh, uh, term in office. I think eight months ago, generally speaking, um, uh, the president got extraordinarily positive press. I think it is a natural experience that you go through periods where you perhaps get a bit more public uh, scrutiny and criticism. And I think this trip happened to fall during uh, that period. Lots of pressing issues at home, as we discussed earlier, on health care and and your Afghanistan and the like and uh, budget issues. And, and let's face it, the American people, for a variety of reasons, are in a sour mood about the state of the economy and unemployment. And so I think there is a general sense of expectation and some anxiety uh, uh, from the U.S. government. I think a larger problem is our previous experience associated with these meetings, and we call them summits. The truth is that we are going to now meet on a much more regular, much more sustained basis with our Chinese interlocutors. And it is unrealistic to expect major breakthroughs at every meeting. That's just not the way the business, the conduct of our relationship will be any longer. It's going to be much more of a business as usual. A third uh, uh, reason, I think, um, I think there was some expectation that the Chinese would, on a variety of issues, say, OK, well, you demand these issues. Well, here's the answer. Um, I would just offer that that's just not how it's going to be, that the Chinese uh, 
um, people feel a new sense that they are rising in global politics. It's not that the United States is declining. We're still a dominant, the dominant power in global politics, and we will remain so for decades. But the truth is, uh, China expects uh, to deal with the United States in a different way. And so when we cooperate, it will be on their terms and when they think it is in their best interests. And sometimes when they deliver that cooperation, they won't do it in an environment when it appears that they are um, uh, responding directly to the demands of an American leader. And are we ready for that? Are we I ready think, for that change? I think if you look historically, the rise of a great power uh, uh, to uh, a new status uh, almost invariably creates tensions um, with the existing powers in the global system, whether it be the United States and Britain, uh, Sparta and Athens. Uh, history has many examples of the challenges that this process provides. I think that the United States has a very deep and substantial education process that will be necessary, not just about uh, American position in the world economically and politically vis-a-vis -vis China, but at a much broader level to understand what's going on inside Asia and China. And I think that process is beginning, but I do think it's going to involve some pain and some difficulties on both sides and probably some tensions. And it will be the greatest test of statecraft, I think, in modern history. Well, speaking of those quest, uh, tensions, let's go to our first question from David Knudy. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Madison, Wisconsin. David asks, what is the greatest threat to U.S.-China relations? Tibet autonomy, Taiwan, protectionism, monetary issues? I think uh, each and every one of those questions, if mishandled, uh, uh, could pose a challenge uh, to U.S.-China relations. I would add another issue, however, that I think is equally important. If the United States and China, and indeed India and Indonesia and other growing states, cannot effectively come to terms with the challenge of climate change, then we are all in the hottest possible water, not to uh, miss, mix metaphors here. And I think that actually poses one of the greatest challenges to U.S.-China relations is a recognition of the contribution and the role we play in global uh, uh, climate change and the necessity um, to uh, deal with these problems uh, earlier rather than later. I think each of these problems has at their core um, the prospect of incidents and unintended actions spinning out of control. One of the things that we've seen historically with various crises like the so-called EP3 incident in the early part of this decade when a American reconnaissance plane uh, collided with a uh, Chinese uh, fighter was that um, the uh, inability to deal initially with the crisis management posed very severe challenges to both countries. And I don't think those mechanisms are well understood or indeed um, very well utilized between the two countries. And so the problem is not simply the issues themselves, which each on standing on their own pose very real uh, problems to our, and that must be managed. But it is also that the United States and China does not have very much, much experience in dealing with, shall we say, problem management. Well, following up on that, FTZ9 uh, from Honolulu, I don't know if that's an avatar or your license plate, but he asks how you would characterize U.S.-China cooperation on global issues such as climate change. And I know mm -hmm. from reading the joint statement, there was a lot said about that. And then I saw a fascinating C-SPAN uh, rebroadcast of a day-long conference in Washington a couple yeah. of weeks ago that had enormously interesting programs that we're cooperating on. With I, I have to say there are a lot of people that are working hard on this issue. I've, I've been very much informed by uh, Ken Lieberthal's very important work on uh, how China is conceptualizing and thinking about its role in climate change. I think I see some areas of progress. I think there is a broad and deep recognition among the elite in both societies that this is an issue that cannot be addressed in a zero-sum fashion, and that um, the path and pace of climate change is much more serious and much more worrisome than the science indicated just a couple of years ago. 
I would say, generally speaking, however, that as we head into uh, Copenhagen, there is a fear that 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 you know there is some timidity, and there's a recognition that how urgent the challenge is. But there are still uh, uh, countries and institutions and actors that are trying to put the brakes on overall. Um, I am relatively hopeful, as I sit here today, that we will get a consequential uh, 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 program in place. And I must say, you know, there are days and times where I lose a little heart, but I, I look at how far we've come in just a couple of years. I can remember a year and a half sitting at a meeting uh, in the U.S. government in which several of the key political appointees were saying, well, look, there's really no such thing as climate change. And I think we've now, uh, despite <laughs> Climate Gate and all these other, right. you know, I think there is now a broad recognition that this poses one of the greatest challenges to global stability and indeed the very life of the planet. And I, I do think that the United States and China are beginning to recognize the stakes at a political and strategic level. And I'm moderately hopeful that we will see progress in both societies and both political institutions. Okay, to move to a questioner from Taipei, um, Ella Chow. Ella wants to know, regarding to democracy, it seems a large distance between Taiwan, Taiwan and China. How will both sides of the Taiwan Strait shorten that distance? It's a very good question. Um, uh, first of all, I, I have to say uh, the United States welcomes this process of dialogue that is taking place currently between Beijing and Taipei. Just a few years ago, that the, just the very idea of diplomacy between the two sides almost uh, seemed unthinkable. And so although there's a long way to go, and it's still, we're primarily focused on economic issues, I think there is a recognition that this is a very hopeful sign. Um, I would say that in many respects that uh, Chinese friends carefully watch the path and progress of Taiwanese democracy. And I think they see some things that they aspire to, and they probably see a few things that worry them uh, enormously. Um, I would say, generally speaking, that, um, uh, that uh, there is, in many respects, a recognition that the um, fullness of the Taiwanese democratic experience is not lost on either the Chinese leaders or the Chinese people and they watch as it develops carefully. Um, when I talk with Chinese friends about Taiwan, though, one of the things they are struck by is how divisive Taiwanese politics uh, uh, have become, <laughs> right. and they worry that if they move in such a direction, would they too have these enormous gulfs and difficulties in making transitions between parties? Those are hard questions, and they're difficult to answer. Um, uh, but overall, I've been struck, Jan's been involved in this a much longer time than I have, but just in the last 10 years, the level of discussion about democratization, concepts of democracy, um, local um, uh, elections, issues associated with greater participation, some of those things were thought of as almost unthinkable just a short period of, uh, ago, and now I hear in much more common circumstances, a dialogue that uh, just a few years ago I would have thought impossible. Right. Th that doesn't mean I think that this is in any way, you know, uh, democracy is right around it's the corner. It's not a slam dunk. <laughs> or, but, but there is an appreciation, a recognition of, of uh, the role that democracy has played, not just in Taiwan, but in Japan, in South Korea, and other parts of Southeast Asia. One of the most... Um, tremendous achievements in recent years is the, pro the path and process, for instance, of democracy in Indonesia out of, uh, you know, an incredibly difficult situation at the end of the 1990s. Indonesia is now one of the most vibrant and exciting democracies in all of Asia. You just mentioned Japan, and Daniel from Weyers Cave, Virginia, asks, now that China has supplanted Japan as the dominant power in Asia, what measures, if any, should the United States adopt to counter the expansion of Chinese power and to bolster allies like Japan? Well, first of all, let me just say that um, I would take issue with that overall characteriz characterization. Japan is still a prominent power in the Asian Pacific region. It plays an enormous role in multilateral institutions. It is one of the largest contributors in the United Nations. Its 
power and influence is felt in ways that China's is not. It is a much larger player in the United Nations. It plays a much larger role in the provision of development assistance. And its moral and political authorities um, and commitment to issues like denuclearization give it a certain cachet um, that is substantial. And with a new leadership in Japan, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, I will tell you that the United States is determined to maintain very strong security and political alliances with the key states in Asia, with Japan, with Australia, with South Korea, um, with uh, uh, Thailand, with um, uh, the Philippines, and with other states like uh, Singapore. I will tell you that one of the most uh, comforting and uh, helpful developments that I've seen in recent months is that in the 1990s, a lot of debates about whether the United States was welcome in parts of Southeast Asia or um, whether our role was helpful. Uniformly now, in most every encounter that I, the President, Secretary Clinton, or others have in Asia, there is a broad and deep welcome of a strong and enduring American role, not just economically, not just politically, but security across the board. Um, we are going to continue to have a very strong relationship with Japan. But I would say that the idea of this sort of chessboard and that we build this relationship to counter this rise, I think that does not reflect that in many respects the challenges that we face in the Asia Pacific region are not zero sum and they are not particularly um, susceptible to balance of power treatments. Well, here's a question I have to take because it's from my hometown, Detroit, Michigan. Okay. And Saeed Khan wants to know, it's also a very interesting question, given China's proximity to South Asia and the potential of cross-border extremism, how should the United States involve China in its policies toward Africa, uh, I'm sorry, toward Afghanistan and Pakistan? Well, um, first of all, I, I would say that there has been an attempt, uh, Ambassador Holbrook, Special Representative Holbrook, to begin a dialogue with China about stability issues in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think it would be fair to say that our dialogue on North Korea and probably on Iran is a little bit more further advanced. One of the challenges that we face, I think, with Chinese friends is that an abiding belief, I think still to this day, among senior Chinese leaders is that it is best for China to follow a path of shallow engagement in global politics and to be very careful about deep engagement in, in any regional particular problem. And indeed, one of the only times that we've seen China pl venture out, play a more prominent role has been in recent years on the so-called six-party talks with North Korea. We have yet to see a particularly active and uh, transparent Chinese engagement in, uh, in Afghanistan, um, although we would welcome more assistance, more commitment to a building of a stable society uh, in Afghanistan. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, this process is going to take a much longer period of time. Well, I, I, we really promised to spread out the questions, so I, at the risk of steaming, playing favorites here, there's another question from Detroit, but it's along okay. those lines, uh, from Ernestine Lyons. How real is the perceived Uyghur radical Islamic terrorist movement? Um, I, I think uh, we've had uh, deep but private, primarily dialogue uh, with Chinese interlocutors about what has transpired in terms of the domestic upheavals and the violence associated um, um, uh, with uh, Uyghurs in a variety of cities throughout China. Um, Chinese friends uh, continue to characterize uh, some of these uh, developments as either uh, terrorist or secessionist or violent uh, 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 attacks. I think the truth is, is much more complicated. And we've tried to underscore in our dialogues that China needs to take a much more responsible role in looking at some of the underlying problems that have contributed to um, tensions and violence between communities inside the country. Um, I think um, the truth is that on a variety of these uh, internal issues, uh, China has taken a very hard line in our interactions. And we've tried to underscore both our continuing commitment to 
uh, the support of democ uh, democracy and human rights, but also the need to deal um, in a responsible way with um, various groups inside the country. Um, I, uh, I don't think we're under any illusions about how difficult this dialogue and this process is with Chinese friends, and it's going to continue, and we will need to have an understanding, again, that there are issues that we're going to be able to work very effectively on, there are going to be issues where we're going to disagree and sometimes disagree vociferously. I know one of those issues that brings me to a question that someone asked. Um, Jordan Nye from Boston. Um, just one of those issues that we totally disagree with the Chinese about. What is the U.S. doing about China not allowing U.S. groups to take North Korean refugees out of China? Mm -hmm. I actually think this is the, one of the most important issues um, uh, that currently we're uh, working on. And in this respect, I must uh, thank personally uh, uh, Senator Sam Brownback, mm -hmm. who has really encouraged me to focus much more on this and to work on this. His vision is that the United States will assist much more in the relocation and the resettlement of North Korean uh, refugees who've left China, uh, who've left North Korea in recent years. And his model, of course, is the very generous ch uh, uh, support that the United States provided uh, to refugees who left Southeast Asia in the wake of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, the conflicts that took place in the 1960s and 1970s, where hundreds of thousands came to the United States. The number of North Korean refugees that have resettled in the United States are barely over 100, an extraordinarily small number. But the reasons for that are complicated, Jan. Um, one is that the primary destination of choice is South Korea, and you can go to South Korea immediately. Um, the South Korean government provides a substantial stipend and re-education efforts to try to assist North Koreans to fit in better into South Korean society. The United States in the wake of 9-11 has a six-month waiting process. Oh. It's very difficult to get through this. We're exploring with Senator Brown back if there are things that we can do to better assist in this process. But there are some immediate steps that I think China can assist with. They can allow the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to have greater access to some of the camps and the groups that are coming over the border. The truth is that, that those numbers have diminished dramatically, I think probably because of a cross-border agreement between North Korea and China. In addition, I think if we can give um, citizen status to North Korean women who have married mm -hmm. Chinese citizens, if they can have the rights at least of the Chinese state and that their offspring are also given those rights, that at least give us a benchmark for how to proceed uh, in certain circumstances. But the truth is, we have not done enough to support this effort. Um, this is a tragedy, and the number of people who have fled North Korea um, is still quite alarming, and it reflects a deeply problematic set of, set of circumstances inside of North Korea. So this question is actually right on. In the United States, we need to do more, not just as a government, but also non-government organizations, institutions, and churches need to step up to meet this um, uh, very real human uh, challenge. Here's a question that I know is near and dear to your heart, and we didn't plant this. It's from Richard Bodman in Northfield, Minnesota, who actually is someone who does some work for us um, escorting Fulbright delegations to China every summer. And Richard wants to ask you to please say something about the present and future of U.S.-China educational yeah. exchanges. <laughs> Thank you. This, and Jan is right about this. One of the things that we worked on and we were, frankly, quite disappointed, got remarkably little attention. Uh, I have pretty much an unerring ability to get this wrong. I thought this would be a very big deal, and it hardly even merited a mention. But we have set up a program that over the next four years, we're going to uh, uh, increase and, and see to it that 100,000 American students have the chance to study in China. And we're going to do that through a variety of programs and uh, support to existing uh, groups and institutions. And we're just very excited about this. And we think that what better way to send a message uh, to China that the United States is interested in working with it than sending your young people. That's just the best possible example. And 
What we've seen is a substantial increase in recent years, but we think steps can be taken to be able to increase that number rather substantially, and we're engaged in that now. We want all levels of education uh, exchange of Americans to go to China. Uh, high school students for a period of time, uh, three to four month uh, uh, programs where they at least get an in initial exposure to the Chinese language, undergraduates for a year or a long semester, and graduate work over a sustained period to study some specific issues uh, uh, on, on China uh, that would be important. We think such an initiative could have a lasting and important contribution to U.S.-China relations. And I must tell you, one of the things that inspired me on this was a uh, story that was told to me by a woman named Jan Barris <laughs> about her early experience going to China and how it changed her life. We want to do that to a number of young people who will be attracted to this incredible drama that's playing out before us and play a role in one of the most consequential bilateral relationships in history. Speaking of young people, Nell from Wales Cave, Virginia, wants to know what role young people under 40, that leaves you and Mia, yeah, are playing in increasing understanding between the United States and China. Well, what's interesting is, you know, President Obama had a chance to have a town hall meeting when he was in um, Shanghai, and it was a complicated deal, all the negotiations. And I must say that I think some Chinese friends were still anxious in the government about, uh, you know, whether, you know, the president should be allowed a completely unfiltered engagement um, uh, with the Chinese people. We believe that a very large percentage, a very large number of people had a chance to look at um, uh, what he said either online or directly, probably 70 or 80 million people in the final analysis. But I, what I was struck by was how sophisticated the questions were um, from uh, uh, Chinese young people. I come from an academic background and I see on a daily basis the level of interest and focus and a recognition that really uh, it is going to be up to the next generation, that we're seeing this tremendous uh, change of the guard, if you will. Um, I was at a dinner not long ago in which uh, Henry Kissinger and Brent Scowcroft and Sandy Berger, all these wonderful men and women who helped define U.S.-China relations over the course of the last um, uh, generation. But the truth is now it's time to pass the baton to a new generation and um, we're hoping that through this education initiatives and a variety of other things that these younger people will be prepared and will want to step up and take the relationship to the next level. Uh, Chung Gong in Dayton, Ohio, wants to know whether you feel Chinese manufacturing decreases jobs in the United States. You know, uh, the issue of trade is one of the most um, uh, challenging and difficult issues confronting the United States uh, uh, and uh, our uh, manufacturing uh, situation is clearly at the top of the list politically. Uh, it is undeniably the case that if you look at the recent job numbers that the United States continues to lose jobs in manufacturing um, globally and I think that process has been underway now um, for decades but it has clearly intensified uh, in recent years. Um, the, uh, those who support uh, free and open trade, and I'm among uh, that group, recognizes that uh, while uh, overall there can be profound and deep benefits, that in the short term there can be um, deep challenges to specific pockets, and clearly we've seen those very significant disruptions in manufacturing and a variety of other textile and uh, uh, other areas of work. I believe that the United States um, uh, has to take some specific steps, both in terms of education, uh, refocusing some of our manufacturing base. I think the President is absolutely correct when he talks about the prospect and potential of green jobs. I think this transition is going to be difficult. It's not going to take, you know, a couple of years. It will likely take um, uh, decades. The United States still can compete and will compete uh, globally in manufacturing. But 
we need to recognize that the nature of the challenge that we face um, uh, from Asia and elsewhere is severe. Government's going to have to take some specific steps. I think it will do so at a, at a, in a way that will keep American markets open and keep our engagement with Asia strong. Um, but as the president said time and time again as he went through Asia, that the current situation in the United States is un untenable. 10% unemployment, enormous pressure to create jobs, uh, to, to build a stronger economic foundation that leads to greater employment. And that in that environment, um, uh, Asian friends need to understand that they need to do more to assist, frankly, in absorbing many uh, exports coming from the United States. Okay, Kurt, we have five minutes left. Okay. We've got lots of interesting so, questions sorry, here on the I'm, table. I'm answering too no, long. no, your answers are fabulous. These are hard questions. They're though. tough questions. I'm really impressed with these. And I've got three tough ones in front all of right. me that I'm going to read you all because okay. they... So I can ignore which one I want. You can yeah. ignore, but they have a common theme. Okay. Um, and hopefully you'll answer it within the now four and okay, three quarters, because uh, we still have more. Uh, from Anonymous in Boston, with all the talk of establishing democracy in China, will you take into consideration the devastating or the destabilizing effect that that might have in China? Um, from Anonymous in Sarasota, if the president cannot demand improvement in human rights, which you started off saying, what is the administration doing to achieve such improvements? And from Christine Towney in Ocala, Florida, do you think China's handling of Tibet reflects American values? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, first of all, let, let me just say that there are a number of ways a country can go about promoting um, democracy and human rights. Um, I think the president has tried to take some very clear steps at home that send a very clear message about uh, those issues um, and are reflected in his determination, for instance, to close Guantanamo, as difficult as that may be. I, I have to say quite honestly, though, as I travel through Asia, and I watch the look on our, our interlocutor's face when they interact with the president, there is a sense of, of almost amazement that a country with a very deep and divided history of racial uh, relations has uh, elected a president like Barack Obama. That's the first level. And I ask, actually think that the very example of that has a powerful um, force in our diplomacy. But it doesn't end there. I will tell you where uh, I also see it on a daily basis. Uh, it's not uh, easy to forget uh, that one of the most difficult, hard-fought political periods in modern history was the fight between President Obama and between then Senator Obama and Senator Clinton. Bitter, divisive, and extraordinarily damaging to the Democratic Party. And when the president decided that he would reach out and ask Secretary Clinton to serve as his Secretary of State, and when she decided to do so and has served him very ably and with total loyalty, I must say that I see the message that that sends in a variety of countries where people find it difficult to lose and deal with their counterparts, not necessarily in China, but in all of Southeast Asia. And so. I, not only do we raise human rights and democracy despite its imperfections and the challenges that they possess uh, in all of our interactions with our Chinese uh, friends, and they come to and they expect it, and we, we work through uh, the issues from uh, uh, the situation with the Uyghurs to Tibet and Taiwan. Um, we, not only do we raise these issues on, on a sustained basis, we also believe that it is also the conduct of uh, our own government and the election of the president and his choice of secretary of state that those examples actually set a context for our engagement that is quite helpful. Um, uh, will these issues be challenging going forward? Absolutely. But ultimately, these decisions will be for the Chinese people. And our role is to provide the best possible example and encouragement along the way. That was a terrific answer, and I am um, sort of thinking I should end on that because we have one minute left. But let me just try one other, and it gives you a chance to okay. do a little 
advertising for the team. It's from Colin Smith in Northfield, Minnesota. Yeah. It harkens back to something we said at the beginning. Many people in the United States have been critical of President Obama's recent trip to Asia. In your opinion, how do you think he did? You can give me a 1 yeah. to 10, or you have 30 seconds to give me a good uh, one. I have never worked with a person who is more disciplined, who knows the issues better, who is committed to Asia, and who works at it very hard than President Obama. And I have to tell you, there isn't a day that goes by, despite all the challenges, that I am not unbelievably grateful for the chance to serve both Secretary Clinton and President Obama. And I just think they're two fantastic people, and it's just an honor to work with them. And I would give them both very high grades in the most difficult possible political environment. Well, and I want to give you very high grades, not only for tonight, but all the work you're doing, I know it's challenging, it's tough. I asked you before if you were having fun, and you said yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have not had one day that I have had any second thoughts or doubts. Every day has been fantastic. Well, and as, as, um, as, as all the kind words that you've said about them, I'm sure if we had the two of them here, they'd say the same about you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure all the people out there watching you tonight also feel the same. And we want to thank, thank you. you so much thank for you, helping Jean. us out. Thank you very much. That's great.